late. Um, today we'll uh, continue um, to look at the, uh, the apostles, the disciples, the 12 uh, that Jesus chose um, during his earthly walk with us. In the last three weeks, we've, we've uh, uh, talked about Peter and Andrew and James, and so today we come to John. Um, so let me just read again the, the list that, that, uh, of the 12 that we started when, as we were going through the book of Mark and we came to the apostles and we kind of slowed down just to talk about each one of them and what they were like and their personalities and um, et cetera. Uh, so in Mark 3.13, uh, Mark records this. He says, and he, that's Jesus, went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired and they came to him. And he appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the 12, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boerogenes, that is, sons of thunder, Andrew and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Let's pray, and then we'll, we'll consider John today. Father, we thank you so much for this time that we can uh, look into your word, this time that we can uh, look into those men that you chose to spread your gospel here on earth and those men that taught other men that taught other men and here we are today so we just pray that as we examine your word and and who these men were that we can uh, learn from them we can be encouraged by them um, we can be comforted by them uh, and knowing who they are and what they were like so just uh, be with me today as i speak may i not misrepresent anything that's in your word uh, we just thank you for this time that we can consider it in your son's name, amen. Okay, so again, we're studying the uh, apostles and, and their, their, their personalities, their temperaments, their, their gifts, their strengths, their weaknesses, and even their failures. We, we understand, and we've been talking the last several weeks, that they were, they were not special in the sense that before God chose them, but they were like you and I. They were ordinary people, ordinary men like you and me. And so as we, as we study what the Bible kind of reveals to us uh, about what they were like, we certainly can see a lot of us in them. We can see what they're like. We can see uh, what they were like and see that, you know, they're not that much different than we were. They had the same, the same failures, maybe some of the same strengths, maybe some of the same personalities and temperaments. Um, <clears throat> And from Scripture, you know, Scripture tells us a lot about some of them, but almost nothing about some of them also. Um, some we know, like Peter and, and John, we know a fair amount just from uh, the Scriptures, uh, the Gospels, and, and certainly in John, his writings, we get a lot and can kind of understand what John was like. Um, but even in, in Christ's closest group of the 12 apostles, which or Peter, Andrew, James, and John. We really don't know much about Andrew. We talked about him a couple weeks ago. We know a little bit about James. He's the brother of John. Um, and in some, as we get down the list of the 12, we know almost nothing about. But we do know a fair amount about John, who we're going to speak of today. Um, but let's just kind of, again, recapitulate last week. Last week, we talked about his brother, James. Okay, and James and John... Jesus nicknamed them Sons of Thunder, okay? And we said from that nickname that Christ gave them, um, we can kind of get an idea about what their personalities were like. I mean, Sons of Thunder, that's a pretty good, straightforward, aggressive kind of name, right? And we, we mentioned a couple of episodes that um, in the Gospels that kind of personified why they were called Sons of Thunder. Okay, and last week we talked about the episode in Luke 9, uh, 51, where uh, James and John wanted to call down fire from heaven and burn up these Samaritans just because they 
wouldn't let his party stay there just because they kind of rejected Christ. They would not do that. But we, we, we talked about that that kind of showed um, uh, the personalities of James and John. You know, they wanted, they were zealous followers of Christ. Uh, the Samaritans, as we talked about last time also, remember that was, there was just this long-term animosity between the Jews and the Samaritans, the Samaritans being, they would call them kind of a half-breed because it was Jews that had intermarried with pagans, um, and their religion was at best called half-breed. They would, they would claim Jehovah, but they would worship other gods and other deities and make sacrifices to other gods and other deities. So there's, there's a long-time animosity between the two, and so, so it kind of culminated when uh, Jesus is returning to Jerusalem, wants to pass through Samaria, but the Samaritans won't let him. They reject him. So James and John comes up to, to Christ and says, he wants to call on fire from heaven? Remember, Elijah did that. You know, so they were justified. It had been happened before. They weren't setting a precedent. And Jesus, uh, and, and that really shows us kind of their, 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 their passionate nature. They were rejected. Their Lord was rejected by these Samaritans whom they really didn't like to begin with. So, so they're, you know, James and John, they're kind of volatile. They're kind of they're a little bit hot-headed. They, but they had a, they had a righteous uh, indignation for that, I guess you could say that. But Jesus rebuked them. He corrected them. He said, you know, this isn't the right time. You know, this, this is the wrong time for that. This is, that's the wrong solution. Um, and that's certainly the wrong reaction you should have. You know, Elijah's time was a time of judgment on a wicked king. This is a time of, of, of redemption. This is a time of saving. He said, Jesus said, I did not come to destroy, but I came to save. And so he's not, at this particular time, Jesus is not in uh, is not judging, okay, because he did not come at that time to judge, but he will come someday to judge, okay, but not now, not now. So he rebuked James and John in their zeal to, you know, um, uh, protect or, uh, I don't know, just get back at the Samaritans for their rejection of Christ. And then we also saw a couple of other episodes that showed us that James and John were ambitious. You recall the episode where they possibly recruiting their mother, went to Jesus and wanted the, to sit on Jesus' right and left side in the kingdom. They wanted the place of most prominent when Jesus came with his kingdom. So they were personally ambitious. I think that kind of gives us that thing. And then they also show that they were overconfident because when they came to Jesus and said, I want to sit on your right and left hand, um, you know, Jesus says, you know, were you able to drink from the cup I'm going to drink from, that cup of suffering, that cup of baptism of fire? And they said, we are able. Okay. Well, you all know what happened when Jesus was arrested. They all fled. So in their own power, they were unable to do that. But they were confident, kind of like Peter was confident that he'd never deny him or leave him. Um, but they understood then later that by Jesus' power, though, they could perform those things that they couldn't in their own earthly uh, uh, power. So James, we can describe last week, brother of John, passionate, zealous, overconfident, ambitious, okay? I recall he's a brother of John, uh, who we a lot of times refer to as the apostle of love, right? Apostle of love, okay, that's what we call him. But we got to remember this, John was also the son of thunder, okay? And he was in the, and in the Gospels, the, the, the records of when Christ walked the earth and John was following him, he was more like his brother John. As a matter of fact, the, the Gospels don't really separate them out. When, it's, when they wanted to call down fire from heaven, uh, and, and when they went to Jesus and asked for the places of most prominence, it said, it said, James and John both went. It doesn't really distinguish who did the talking, okay? But, but you can, they were both in agreement, obviously, because they both went at the same time, so they talked about it. So they were similar in that respect, and certainly being brothers, you could understand that. So John, the apostle of love, is every bit son of thunder as James was. He called down fire from heaven. He wanted the grace prominence. He was overconfident. So but today, how do we think of John? I mean, we, when we picture John, and we picture even, you know, paintings of him, pictures of him. We kind of think of this, um, 
kind of soft-spoken, maybe a little skinny-armed, almost effeminate kind of guy laying on Jesus' bosom. You know, the apostle of love, he's very soft. But he wasn't like that at all. He wasn't like that at all. But part of his learning to love came from his time he spent with Christ and the Holy Spirit working in him over the years. As you know, James, the other son of thunder, was martyred early. Uh, spoke last time. That could have been an indication that he continued to be that same passionate, volatile personality and seemed to stir up more trouble, and therefore Herod wanted to get rid of him first. Um, that's a little bit of speculation. But John, his brother, lived into his 90s. Lived into his 90s. A long time. He kind of became the patriarch, you know, of the, uh, of the early church. So under, his, under the inst- John, and, and during that 90-some-odd years, he wrote five books. He wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Revelation under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Um, And so what we really know about John, we extract from his writings, which kind of came after the times that he walked on earth with Christ. So there was a long time there that the Spirit could change him, work him, teach him all the things, bring into remembrance all the things that Christ taught him while he walked on the earth. Um, In the Gospels, in the time he walked on earth, you know, John is always kind of paired with either his brother James or he's always with uh, Jesus, sometimes with Peter. But there's one time that, that John spoke alone in the gospel, okay? And that's recorded for us on your handout here in Mark 9, 38 to 41. And it gives us a little bit of a, uh idea, again, how John was and what he said that. So let me just kind of read that, that uh, episode there. It says, John said to him, that was to Jesus. Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said to him, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterwards to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Now, that episode we got to kind of put into context. It comes shortly after uh, James, John, Peter were witnessed Christ's transfiguration, witnessed the glory of Christ here on earth, okay? Thinking that, and those three were the ones that Jesus took to reveal that to them. And so they come down from the mountain, and Jesus tells them, you know, don't tell anybody about this, okay? You know, you need to keep this to yourself. But then, immediately following that, they're, they're on the road, and they're talking about who's the greatest. Okay, You can kind of see that. I mean, they just saw, I mean, they would think pretty highly of themselves. They actually witnessed this uh, glory of our Lord and thinking they're pretty special because they got to see it. And so now they're kind of prideful, I guess you would say. And so they're, but they can't tell anybody, but they're, they're um, asking each other who was the greatest. And so Jesus, you know, turned around. No, nobody admitted that, but Jesus knew that they were discussing who was the greatest. And so then Jesus, you know, gives them that object lesson on, on servanthood, on, on, you know, you must serve all to be the greatest. You, you, you're the servant. That's the one that is the greatest in my kingdom. And so immediately after that, object lesson on being a servant and immediately after uh, the three were up there in the transfiguration John then says this says what we just read here in John 38 he said we saw someone casting out demons in your name okay that's a good thing and we tried to stop him not sure why they wanted to stop him but the reason he gives is because he was not following us or he was not part of our little group They were different than us. They were outside of us, and he's doing these things for Christ. So we are trying to stop him, because only we can do that, right? I mean, you know, who does he think he is? You know, we're going to be in your kingdom. We're going to sit on the 12 thrones in in your kingdom. What is he doing that? But he does it kind of almost in a, when he he confesses this to Jesus, he's kind of doing it almost as, as a, confessionally. He kind of maybe understood what Jesus had just told him about servanthood, and so he's kind of 
confessing it. But it gives you an idea, but he did it, and so it gives you an idea that he was kind of, um, say, prideful, maybe sectarian, only us, you know, he, just our little group can do it. He wants to, you know, those people can't do it because they're not part of us. You can understand that. Uh, so, so we can see from that and the other episodes with James and John that John was also capable of behaving in a narrow-minded, uh, unbending, I think I wrote it on here, similar, well, similar as James, who we, we talked about with Zealous last time. They're zealous, volatile, brash, personally ambitious, sectarian, meaning our own little group. It's just, it's, it's just us, it's not them. Narrow-minded and unbending. Okay, I don't know if any of you fit any of those categories there, but I think we all do at a certain time. And so, so that, that was John. But as John walked with Christ, Okay, as he listened, as he learned, he observed, as the Holy Spirit, again, brought into remembrance all the things that Christ said, John's writing then reflect um, more of a love in nature. It, it, they really reflect two things. Number one, he's still zealous and passionate for the truth. He, you know, ever since um, John and Andrew uh, were up there following John the Baptist, and John the Baptist said, you know, Behold the Lamb of God. And John and Andrew immediately went and followed him because they knew that that was the Messiah. That's who Jesus was the one they're looking for. That was the truth. And ever since that time, they had that, that nature, that zealous nature that continued to follow him. Um, but John's, um, but that zealousness remained in his writings as manifested by the way he speaks of the truth of God. In other words, he doesn't, he doesn't water it down. He teaches it really in very absolutes, black and white things. I mean, things that, that you know, this is the kingdom of God. This is the kingdom of the devil. Because um, light and darkness, you know, uh, in, in the Gospels, he, these are some of his contrasts to make things absolute so that people understood there was a truth and there is and this is it, okay? He, he would contrast the kingdom of God with the kingdom of, of the devil. Light and darkness is, is a, uh, a theme that is all throughout his gospel. He would contrast the children of God with the children of Satan. You know, there's only, only one or the other. There's no middle road on any of these. There's only light and darkness. There's not in the shadows, really, okay? Uh, life versus death, eternal life versus eternal death. Um, there's nothing in between. These are absolutes. Uh, spoke of the judgment of the righteous versus the judgment of the wicked. Okay, again, that's judgment to eternal life, judgment to eternal death. Uh, the resurrection to life and the resurrection to damnation. Uh, I talked about receiving Christ, rejecting Christ. There's only two choices there. Okay, it's, it's pretty absolute. And John is writing wanted to let us know that. He would also say, you know, you bear fruit or you're fruitless. Okay, it's, it's, it's nothing in between. Love and hate, obedience, disobedience. Those are, those are, they're at opposite ends of the spectrum. And John in his writings, especially in his Gospel of John, uh, brought those out so that it was understood there is a truth. It's not a wishy-washy truth, but it's an absolute truth. But in his epistles, he was even more... Um, more zealous for that and, and, and trying to make uh, certainly his readers understand uh, the truth again in absolute terms is the best way of saying it. Um, I think I wrote some down here, some of the passages in 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Uh, he says this, This is the message we have heard from him, Jesus, and proclaimed to you. Okay. And again, he's speaking to the church. He's speaking to Christians. He's speaking to believers. This is the message, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. None at all. That's the contrast. There. God is light, so when he speaks in the light, there's no darkness. There's not even a hint of darkness in our Lord. Okay, We are talking about uh, the glory of God and the glory of Christ in Tuesday night Bible studies, and, and that's... He is light. Everything he does is good. And that's the contrast there. And then verse 6 says, though, if we say we have fellowship with him, with God, okay, 
while we walk in darkness, okay, we lie and do not practice the truth. So there will be those that would profess to have fellowship with our Lord, but their life is one of continual sin in darkness or evil. Uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't back up what they say. And so he says, that's a liar. And we know the fate of all liars is in the um, uh, lake of fire. And then in uh, chapter 3 of 1 John, he says, he kind of clarifies it a little bit more to make it absolute. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. So if your life is manifested by a continual sin nature, by a continual sinning, uh, manifested by following the world and the world's, uh, uh, the world's ideas, he says, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. In verse 9, no one born of, born of God makes a practice of sinning. Okay, so if you are born of God, your life will not manifest a practice of continual sin. I think that's pretty straightforward. So no one born of God does that, makes a practice of sinning. And this is why, because God's seed abides in him. God's spirit abides in him. Therefore, he cannot keep on sinning. God's seed in you will man be manifested by life that not is one of continual sin. Um, and verse 10 says, by this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Really, your life kind of tells people who you are. Now, certainly, there can be deceivers and things like that, but, the, I, but if you're a, a a sinner and have those secret sins and stuff like that, you yourself will know. You yourself will know if you are children of God or children of the devil. And it says, whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. And so our, our life should, should manifest a continued righteousness in them, a continued searching to be more and more like God. And then he adds, nor is the one who does not love his brother. So, Loving your brother is certainly another manifestation of your salvation, another manifestation of the Holy Spirit living within you, another manifestation of being a child of God as opposed to a child of the devil. You cannot have the Holy Spirit live within you and not have a love for your brother. He, First John is very clear about that. Um, and so he goes on then in the next one in, in uh, chapter 4, he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. So if you are also a person that does not manifest love, and we got to understand what love means, okay? Love is not that sentimental feeling. Love is... It's not even really liking, you know, like that. Love is that true desire to do what's best for the other people, that, the agape love. That, that's the love that, that, that John learned from Christ and that um, he manifests and teaches us in his, in his writings uh, by the Holy Spirit. So, so if you're one that does not manifest that, you have to question, are you a child of God? Are you, do you have the Spirit living within you? Because, um, <clears throat> uh, because in verse 8 it says, anyone who does not love does not know God. Because God is love. And so that's a, that's a beautiful statement here. If you are not a loving person, one that, that truly wants um, the best for the other person and, and makes that manifest, then uh, you have to question whether you're of God or not. So it, it, John's pretty absolute about if your life manifests righteousness, you're of God. If your life manifests kind of continued practice of sinning, you're not of God, you're of the devil. Okay, pretty, pretty black and white there, pretty absolute terms, okay? Um, but he understood that, that sinning, that we would still sin because in... In chapter 1, verse 8, he'd already said this before he said those other things. He says, if we, have no, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. So we understand we still have sin, right? And the truth is not in us. So if we can somehow claim, and we all here understand we still have the remaining sin within us, right? Um, 
But if we somehow claim that we don't have that, we certainly have been deceived, and the truth's not in us. And, and verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Doesn't he say that? So we're making him a liar if we say we haven't done that. So, so John understands that we all still sin, but he, he gives these absolutes of a life that is not a practice of sinning, and a life that is a practice of sinning, a life that is of God and has the truth, and a life that is not. But he understands we still have sin, but he doesn't kind of dwell on that, okay? You know, Paul kind of dwells on that in his, and so, and, and you know, Paul's writings are inspired. You know, John's writings are inspired by, they're all inspired, so we have to understand these in the context. But John seems to write in a very uh, kind of son of thunder way, an absolute kind of way to make it known um, to make it known the truth, because that is, that, is, um, that is what he reflects here. So John's writings reveal kind of his zeal and his passion and for the truth, uh, and really his, kind of his personality as a son of thunder, and he's going to do it, and he, and he states these truths in, in absolute, no uncertain terms. But there must be a balance there between this truth and the love that John is kind of known for. And again, that balance is very, very important. Um, because it can be just as imbalanced to harp on the truth, 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 and it's just as as uh, damaging, I would say, to be um, sound doctrinally, sound theo- theologically, okay, but have an in, have a spirit that is unloving, because that truth then comes out as um, self-exalting, prideful, um, unloving, like we said. And, and all those, those terms you kind of can describe John in, in his early days. I mean, he was kind of self-exalting. He wanted the highest place in the kingdom, right? He was somewhat unloving because he wanted to kill all the Samaritans. Um, and he certainly was prideful because he thought only his little group could be the one that, that you know, would cast out demons and do things for the Lord. So people that, that are grounded in the truth but have no love for others, it will come out, the, the gospel will, will come out as just something like cold hard facts. Um, it'll be um, like a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal, just like Paul says in 1 Corinthians. It'll just be noise. Uh, it can almost get to the point where it, it can remove the power that the truth of the gospel has. Although it can't, but it, it, it kind of diminishes that because of the way it's presented. So, so John, as a son of thunder, knew truth, knew everything he taught, but he kind of learned love. He had to learn that uh, because in his early years, it seemed like he didn't have it. He learned that from Christ. Um, and it seemed as, as John grew older and began to write his letters under the inspiration of the Spirit, and the Spirit brought back everything that he, that he had taught him, John seemed to understand that love more and more. You know, the love that God has for us, uh, his, and his love for, for God, and his love for Christ, and his, his love for one another. And he understood that that, that love was really the the engine behind his desire to tell people the truth. It was because of that love that God had shown him that he loved God back, that he loves other people. That love is really what drove him to tell the truth. So truth without love is just as bad, though, as love without truth. Okay? I mean, they can get either way. Um, John's love was always balanced. That's why he spoke the truth in absolutes, okay? Um, but many today can, can get it a little bit off balance. That fulcrum can be over here on the, uh, uh, on the love side. You know, love, truth, love, truth. And love side gets kind of more weight. And it becomes a dominant theme in many of our churches today. Um, and that's really why, um, you know, sin is not preached like it should be because, 
you know, the, the love says, you know, it doesn't matter if you sin, you know, God still loves you. God still has a wonderful plan for your life, right? You know, just look at John 3, 16. He loved the world. You know, he gave his son for you. So Jesus already paid it. You know, don't worry about it. Don't, uh, don't feel guilty about it because that's bad for your self-esteem. Okay, we know that we all need to have good self-esteem, right? So that, that's kind of love over there. And, but what's missing is, is really the truth. And so that kind of love just becomes um, just kind of a tolerant, um, shallow, kind of sentimental kind of love. You know, it just appeals to your sentiments because it sounds good to, to do that. But it's really not a genuine love. Matter of fact, it's, it's, it's tainted. It's, it's, almost, it's almost hatred if you think about it because now you're loving someone um, and have no concern for the truth and what God's word says about sin, repentance, and just love these people uh, in their sin um, and just... And just take something that's expressly forbidden, say in God's word, and just kind of gloss it over. Okay, that's that's not true love, because true love wants what's best for that person, for that person. So true love will will confront the person with the truth of God's word. And so we can't just, you know, um, just love, 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 and and those that do that, um, you know. The reasons they do it probably are, are multifactorial, but, but maybe they're just ignorant of the scriptures and the truth of the scriptures, and so they just focus on that one side of love uh, and don't, don't, don't speak about sin and repentance, although that is as much a scripture as a love, much a part of the scripture as love is. Um, maybe they just don't care about the truth. You know, maybe they just want everybody to get along. Now, that could be their ultimate goal, and so they, they don't want to see car, and they don't want to address the tough issues. Or maybe, at worst, they're deceived. They're deceived in themselves. They're deceived by the world. They're deceived by what the world says and how the world views them. Um, many reasons. But, but that kind of love that glosses over sin um, and uh, makes someone feel good uh, in their sin. That, that kind of love is foreign to John, um, but that kind of love is kind of taken to extremes today. We, we know that. Now, but John speaks a lot about love, and that's why we understand him to be the apostle of love. He uses the word love 80 times in his writings in those five books, but he also uses the word truth 45 times. Okay? And he has another word that he throws in there a lot, and the word is witness. Witness, witness, witness to the truth, witness to, and it's described in, in many different things, witness to John the Baptist, and John the Baptist taught truth, okay, witness to the scripture, the scriptures teach truth, witness to the Father, obviously the Father teaches truth, witness to Christ, Christ teaches truth, witness to all the miracles, they were witness to the miracles, the miracles spoke of the truth of, of Christ, and witness of the Holy Spirit, and even witness of the apostles, the apostles spoke truth also. So, Clearly, John learned to balance these two things, truth and love. And he really probably learned to love others, okay, as the Lord loved him. Remember how he described himself in the book of John, the disciple Jesus loved. He never spoke of that this was me, the disciple Jesus loved. So he had that, he probably had, like we do, we wonder why our Lord would love us. And he probably thought the same thing. And so he just made much of that because, because it was just so awesome to him that he would love someone like, like John. So John's theology, you know, theology of love, right? Okay. Um, but he really taught the, the, the truth. And so he, what he taught as far as God's love is that uh, God is a God of love. We read that in First John. God is love. First John four, eight. He speaks of that God loved His Son, okay, and He sent Him for us. God loved the world because He loved us, right? Uh, Christ loved God. Christ loved His disciples. You recall in that, and at the end of the book of John, He said He loved them till the end, till the very end. Still loves them today. The disciples loved Him, Christ. 
And, you know, John even says all men should love Christ. Obviously, if we have that um, love for others, that agape love, we should teach all men about Christ, and they should love him. He, he makes it imperative that we should love one another. We would love one another. And then he says love fulfills the law. Love fulfills the law. But the law is truth. The love is from God. And so John never let his love kind of slip into this just feeling and this sentimentalism uh, that uh, we just all want to get along and sing Kumbaya and all those things. It's all grounded in the truth. His love is all grounded in the truth because John, the son of thunder, is zealous. He has this overarching zeal for the truth, and he makes it clear, no absolute terms. So John, we know a lot about one of the, one of the four of the inner group, um, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Uh, and that, that kind of concludes that inner circle that Christ had. And as we move forward, we'll see uh, Philip and Matthew and some of the others that we know a little bit less about. But, but, um, but we can also get the same idea that John was not, did not seem to always be a loving person he was a volatile he was a zealous he was passionate about things but he didn't always have this concern for others he wanted to he wanted to call down fire from heaven when they angered him he wanted the highest places in the kingdom um he wanted to have his own little group there and not let anybody else in it he was really a lot like you and i i mean we have these qualities that creep up every now and then some more than others um but John, John learned love. He learned love walking with Christ. He learned love as a spirit, um, as a spirit infused him uh, after Christ's resurrection and death. And he died, like I said. His brother James was the earliest to be martyred. Uh, but John's brother lived to be in the 90s, 98, they think. And, um, and he was exiled to the island of Patmos where in his later years where he wrote Revelations. And... Um, and he, uh, some of the tradition, I can't remember which writer this was, it said that he, he was so feeble at age 90 and stuff that people would have to help him around. And he would continually call them my little children. You know, he says that in First John, my little children, all of them. He said, my, he would continually say, my little children love one another. It is the Lord's command. And if this alone be done, it is enough. So he, he learned love from Christ. He learned to love one another, and we should too. So uh, let's pray, and then we'll fellowship for a little bit and continue with our worship. Father, we uh, again thank you so much for uh, this opportunity to look into your word. We thank you that, um, that you have shown us your love, that you loved us first. We love because you first loved us. We must never forget that, and you can love someone like myself you can love someone like john you can love uh someone is just really awe inspiring to us um but as you do dear lord i pray that you will teach us your truth and you will teach us your love and let us not become out of balance with either one but understand them both and uh so that we may glorify you in your son's name amen <clears throat>